Uh, our first speaker for the uh, second session of the morning is Chiara Farinato. Uh, she's my colleague at HBS uh, in the Technology and Operations Management Unit. She's part of the HBS Digital Initiative uh, and is also the National Bureau of Economic Research. She completed her PhD at Stanford, prior to that a master's uh, jointly between Bocconi, uh, Bocconi and the Catholic University of Louvain, uh, and previously her bachelor's also at Bocconi. She does this amazing collection of work sort of at the intersection of industrial organization and digitization and sort of uh, an internet business and innovation. Uh, it is super cool. Uh, how cool is it? Uh, I attended a talk, you know, so I came across one of her papers long before I actually met her. I was like, this is the coolest stuff ever. Uh, and was then super excited when she like sort of moved to my campus. Um, her accolades include the, uh, the Haley Shaw Fellowship, the Bonalda Stringer Fellowship, and the Erasmus Fellowship. Uh, she's also worked at the European Commission, so uh, if you have questions about uh, European politics, I'm, I'm sure you can give us data. Is this accurate? It was a long time ago. It was a long time ago. Fair enough. Um, and uh, also, I believe she's the only speaker in the conference to have been covered by Bloomberg Business Week. Uh, so, let's welcome Kiara to tell us about consumer reviews and regulation, evidence from New York restaurants. Thank you so much, Scott, for that awesome introduction. Um, thank you for having me today. Um, I, I'm going to bring the conversation from aliens back to humans who are hungry and decide to eat at restaurants. Um, and this is joint work with Yorgos Zervas at Boston University. So the motivation for this paper is actually um, uh, uh, information asymmetries, the well-known um, lemons market problem for which Akerlof actually won the Nobel Prize. When consumers lack information about the quality of a certain service or of a particular good, they might not trust the seller and the seller might actually not have the right incentives to invest in high quality products or high quality services. And so historically, uh, to solve this information asymmetry problem, regulation has been put in place to um, monitor the quality of service providers occupational licensing, um, health and safety inspections, uh, and certifications are all put in place to screen um, seller's quality and to um, uh, at least incentivize certain service providers to invest in high quality services and goods. But in recent years, um, technology has facilitated the diffusion of online review systems. Now TripAdvisor uh, is used to uh, review uh, restaurants and uh, local attractions. Uh, Yelp is used again also for restaurants and uh, local services. And um, in the context that we will be studying the restaurant industry, these two types of monitoring systems take the form of regular, regular health and safety inspections of, uh, of New York City restaurants and online reviews on, um, on Yelp. And I don't know about you, but um, recent surveys have shown that actually online reviews seem to be one of the main sources of information that consumers take into account when making choices about service providers. Okay? So in a context where online reviews have become this important source of, uh, of information for consumers, we really want to ask two sets of questions about the role of online reviews first in informing consumers about restaurant hygiene. We picked restaurant hygiene because we have data, but it could be any other type of information uh, about quality that, that consumers might care about. And, and what is the role of online reviews in ensuring restaurant uh, hygiene standards? So to answer this set of questions, we really need to divide our projects into two uh, parts. The first one is that we don't even know whether online reviews can serve as an informative signals about hygiene of restaurants. So the first um, important question is for which dimensions of restaurant hygiene uh, reviews serve as an informative signal. Do they review whether restaurants have mice 
do they review whether the pipes in the back of the of the restaurant are are are, are kept in good maintenance? And the second sub question is really uh, more of a causal type of question, um, which is whether hygiene signals in reviews affect where consumers choose to eat and in turn affect restaurants' incentives to invest in high quality. Okay? So um, to answer these, uh, these questions, we make use of, uh, um, and, and I guess this is the justification for why these, these, uh, this paper is in, in this set of talks, we make use of a bunch of uh, uh, data sets. Uh, we have health inspection records from New York City for the period of July 2007 and September 2016. Um, this gives us information at the inspection and violation code level. So for each violation code, there's about 100, and I'll be more specific uh, later on, but there's about 100 violation codes that inspectors care about, and for each and every single one of them, the inspector grades the restaurant um, on their cleanliness. Uh, we have inspector IDs, which will be useful to create some instruments for uh, the inspection score. And we have restaurant characteristics, location, cuisine, um, and their entry and exit dates if they went out of business. Uh, we have about 448,000 inspections and 57,000 restaurants. Of these inspections, I'll, I'll show you how we select the ones that we think are more truthful of the restaurant hygiene quality. Uh, we have then uh, scraped Yelp reviews, we have the time, the text and the ratings, and we have the complete set of reviews for New York City restaurant. This covers about uh, half of the restaurants that are inspected by the New York uh, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And this is because uh, some cafeterias that might not receive reviews on Yelp are actually inspected by the New York City Department of Health. Um, and, and then, because we want a proxy for demand, for consumers' choices of where they want to eat, we've been painstakingly, since April 2013, scraping open table availability for all the New York City restaurants. So every night, our, um, our scraper goes on open table and checks whether a particular restaurant is available at 7 p.m. for two people. Okay? Good. So let me first show you really briefly a conceptual framework to understand how signals can affect demand, can affect where consumers choose to eat, and in turn they can affect restaurants' incentives to invest in quality. Okay, So think of some single dimensional underlying quality uh, for a restaurant, whether they have mice in the premises or not. Um, and um, Think about a signal which is going to be, whose realization is going to be distributed somewhere around the true level of quality, okay? And um, the more informative the signal is, the closer this distribution will be around the true quality level. And if we think about demand on the y-axis, if the signal is informative, Demand is going to positively respond to a high signal realization and it's going to be negative to, to negatively respond to a low signal realization. So you're going to have a demand curve that's going to be increasing in the signal realization. For a totally uninformative signal, demand is just going to be completely flat. Okay? Now, think of adding an additional signal. Let's say that this signal is actually the health and safety inspection outcome, okay? For whether there's mice in the premises or not. Now, think of adding an additional signal, okay? Consumers talking about whether there's mice in the premises on Yelp, okay? And think about the combination of these two signals as a more informative signal about the true quality of, uh, of, uh, of a restaurant, okay? Because the signal is more informative, now demand is going to be more responsive to each realization. It's going to lower the probability of showing up at a restaurant for very low signal realizations, and it's going to actually increase the probability of showing up at a restaurant for high signal realizations. Okay? Now, 
because investing in quality from the point of view of the restaurant owner, because investing in high quality makes high signal realizations more likely, and because to high signal realizations, consumers respond more positively um, by, by showing up at the restaurant, the owner is actually going to have higher incentives, greater incentives to invest in, in quality. And so the optimal chosen quality level of the restaurant is actually going to be higher in the presence of a more informative signal. Okay? So this is sort of a very simple conceptual framework. There's nothing new, but it actually helps us in sort of mapping what we have in this theoretical framework to what we need in the empirical exercise to actually look at how signals affect demand and, and, and supply choices, okay? So what we need is signals of hygiene from regulation. These are sort of the signals that we begin with that historically we've been used to um, relying on. Signals of hygiene from online reviews. And actually, we don't have those readily available because online reviews talk about anything. They talk about the atmosphere. They talk about the food taste. So we need sort of some labels. Uh, we need some true hygiene uh, information to extract hygiene signals from reviews. And we're going to use health and safety inspection data for that purpose. And then we're going to have demand as a function of quality signals and suppliers quality choice. So I'm going to go through each and every of these bullet points to, to explain to you where we get these, these pieces of information. So the signals of hygiene from regulation, that's the easiest part. That comes from the inspector's data. Okay. The New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene um, conducts frequent unannounced inspections of restaurants, coffee shops, cafeterias, nightclubs, and, and bars. And the objectives are not just to inform consumers about restaurant hygiene uh, conditions, but also to improve restaurants' food preparation practices and reduce diseases that are foodborne. Okay? Uh, what do inspectors look for? They look for a bunch of different uh, dimensions of, of cleanliness, from vermin to worker hygiene and, and, and contamination. And for each and every single one of the violation codes, they are going to assign a score, higher score in New York. In other cities, it's different, but higher score in New York is actually worse. And then they are going to aggregate all these scores to the terminal letter grade to be displayed at the door. A, B, or C. And of course, restaurants have very creative ways of displaying their grades at, at the door. Uh, but what is important is that this signal, this letter grade, is going to serve as our signal of hygiene uh, from the regulator. Okay? Now we need the true hygiene, a label, of a, a true label that tell us tells us at some point in time how clean a restaurant is on each and every single dimension uh, that we care about to extract the hygiene signals from reviews. And we're going to use a particular subset of the inspections that the New York City Department of Health conducts. Why? Because an inspection cycle is a series of inspections that leads eventually to a letter grade. Okay? And an inspection cycle is typically a set of two inspections. An initial inspection where if the restaurant is found clean, the restaurant is going to obtain an A card and it's just going to be inspected about 12 months from today. Okay? The, the inspection is unannounced, so we actually have distributions. They are not going to be inspected exactly 12 months later, so there's some uncertainty as to when the inspector shows up. But if at the initial inspection, the restaurant is found dirty, nothing happens. The restaurant gets to display the prior card from the previous inspection cycle. It's going to be told that another inspector or the same inspector, the inspector allocation is random, is going to show up a few weeks from today and it's go they are going to conduct a re-inspection. At which point they are going to be assigned a letter grade if they fixed up their hygiene conditions, but that's A. B or C, depending on their hygiene level 
at that reinspection. Okay, sort of the, 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 the conditions found at initial inspection don't really matter at that point. And so this leads to a situation in which initial inspections are relatively truthful measures of the underlying hygiene of restaurants. Because if a restaurant is found dirty, there's not really a lot of negative consequences from that negative, um, negative score, okay? With the exception, of course, of being right at the threshold, and you see this here a big discontinuity between uh, restaurants that get scores of 13 points or less which obtain an A grade automatically, and restaurants that obtain a score of 14 or more, which get reinspected. And by the end of the inspection cycle, you know, over 70% of restaurants, and actually when, because there is an adjudication, um, you can actually complain about a particular grade to an adjudication tribunal, about 80% of the restaurants end up obtaining an A letter grade. And you might say that that's because every restaurant is clean, or you might say that the, the, the system makes it so that uh, restaurants can quickly fix things for the second inspection and then quickly go back to um, uh, having mice in the premises. Okay, so um, because the initial inspection is unannounced, there's actually, I'm not showing it here, but there's actually a lot of uh, uh, variability within a restaurant over the years in their um, uh, hygienic condition. It's not the case that a restaurant is always an A restaurant. There's actually a lot of transitions. Um, uh, and uh, given the regulatory framework, initial inspections are a relatively truthful measure of, um, of uh, restaurant hygiene. We are going to use the initial inspections outcomes as our true measure of hygiene, okay? We're going to focus on the 20 most frequent violation codes. These constitute 80% of all violation occurrences, and we're gonna take the occurrence of a violation as the inspector saying that the restaurant is dirty, and actually um, that being the true uh, level of, uh, of, uh, of hygiene of, of the restaurants, okay? So that's our true hygiene. Now we need to extract signals of hygiene from, the, uh, from online reviews. And that's where sort of the prediction problem comes in and where we use a, a, a particular uh, intuition. To the extent that uh, online reviews are a predictor of uh, uh, hygiene, of restaurant hygiene, Conditional on the occurrence of a particular violation, think about 04M, live roaches, we would expect that consumers start talking about roaches in the reviews preceding that inspection, okay? So if that's the case, the changing nature of the text in online reviews is going to help us in predicting uh, the hygiene conditions of each and every restaurant. So to do that, we're gonna use a technique that's nothing new that actually Gensko and Shapiro have used to study political slant of congressional speech. But the idea is basically to associate to the outcomes of uh, um, violation outcomes um, a set of text, okay? This set of text, text is going to be the entire vector of word rating frequencies in Yelp reviews. So if you think about just the, um, a vector of all the words that have been used in the reviews submitted in the preceding 90 days, in the 90 days prior to a given inspection, okay? And because the word clean in a one-star review has a different meaning from the word clean in a five-star review, we're gonna consider them as two different words, okay? Um, and uh, we are first going to predict text from the occurrence of violations. So 
one, one problem is that text is multidimensional. So if we were just to try and predict the occurrence of violations from, uh, from text, we would end up with more observation, with more regressors than observation. So we first perform an inverse regression where our outcome is actually the word counts of each and every word, and we predict it as a function of the inspection outcomes, okay? This gives us an important matrix, and matrix phi, okay, which is um, sort of the number of violation long and the, the number of words wide, and it's going to give us factor loadings, okay? What is a factor loading? This matrix, by the way, is going to be very, very sparse. It's going to have mostly zeros because of regularization, but um, this, uh, a high factor loading is going to mean that conditional on a particular violation occurring, the occurrence of that particular word is going to go up, okay? So I'm going to show you in the next slide the word violation pairs with the highest factor loadings. So the highest probability of occurrence of that word conditional on that violation occurring. And so if we look high up here, when we see live roaches present in facilities food, people talk about roach, diarrhea, facility being not vermin proof, they talk about mice, they talk about rat, they talk about cockroach. So a lot of the words that actually are predictive of these violations are descriptive of the substance of the violation itself. For other violation codes, the words that sort of light up in predicting them are actually not very predictive, very descriptive of the violation uh, itself. They are just words that describe some general frustration. By the way, the, if, if there's one thing that I learned from looking at these words is that Groupon discounts are not a great um, thing to buy for, for restaurants, okay? And so we can actually now look for every single violation, how informative our online reviews are. And you'll see that actually online reviews are much more informative of these dimensions of hygiene that, uh, than, than these dimensions of, uh, of hygiene. Why? Because we can actually use now this big matrix to reduce the dimensionality of text. We're going to reduce it from thousands of words to just a 20 element vector, and we can throw away text for the purpose of predicting violations, okay? And then we can use um, sort of the area under the curve as a measure of our informativeness of, of, of our signal, and we're going to have the area under, under the curve for each and every one of these violations. And so you can see that, first of all, for, for the computer scientists in the room, um, these um, um, predictability measures are very low. It's very hard to predict violations from the text of Yelp reviews. And at least for two reasons. One is that the inspector is going to show up at random on a given day, and that day the mice might just be sleeping, even if they are, they are physically there. The second thing is that potentially consumers might not be able to see uh, the, the, the true hygiene of, uh, of restaurants. But one important thing is that there's quite a bit of heterogeneity in the informativeness, in the ability of online reviews to predict uh, these dimensions of hygiene. In particular, online reviews are much better at, at predicting food um, handling violations and vermin violations food not held, held at the right temperature, uh, vermin present uh, in, uh, in the premises, and they're much worse at predicting uh, violations that are sort of back of the, of, uh, of the kitchen, so uh, maintenance and, and uh, pipes. Okay, so now we have these signals of hygiene from, uh, from online reviews, okay? We can use the, these two sets of signals to actually look at demand as a function of these quality signals. How do consumers respond when they see a letter grade C on the, at the restaurant or when they see that online reviews talk about mice in the premises, okay? And so to do that, uh, we're going to use as demand proxy 
our um, probability of being sold out on open table. So if we don't see uh, a table available on a given day for one of the given restaurants in, uh, in New York City, uh, we're going to take that as a measure of high demand. Okay? And our signals that we're going to use in our regressions are going to be the letter grade posted at the door, the Yelp ratings, and the Yelp text about hygienic conditions. And I should mention that actually in the economic literature, both the letter grade and the Yelp ratings have separately been studied um, to, to, to look at their effect on, uh, on demand. We're sort of trying to combine this literature together and adding this additional signal um, about hygiene that comes from the text of Yelp reviews. So, okay? The problem is that when we think about causal inference, there's a lot of things that might both be correlated with our uh, signals and our outcome variable, okay? That are unobservable to the econometrician, but they might be observable to the consumers, okay? So we're gonna try to instrument for a lot of these, um, uh, a lot of these uh, variables of interest. So um, we're gonna instrument for the letter grade posted at the door with the inspector's stringency. So because inspectors are randomly allocated to the different restaurants um, to be inspected, and because inspectors, I'm not showing it here, but in, in practice that's the case, because inspectors vary a lot in their level on, of, uh, of stringency, we can actually instrument for a restaurant's probability to receive a letter A, okay, with the stringency of the inspector that's actually inspecting that restaurant at that particular moment, okay? There's another instrument that we can use as being the repeated interaction. So typically, inspectors are more lenient if they've already seen a restaurant owner, and so repeated interaction dummies can be used as, as instruments. We're going to use a similar instruments. I'm not going to go really much into the details, but we're going to use similar instruments on Yelp. So to the extent that uh, Yelp reviewers are randomly allocated to reviewing uh, restaurants, and some reviewers are more picky than others, we can use their reviewer stringency to instrument for the average rating that's displayed on, uh, on a Yelp restaurant page. We don't have instruments for for our for our um, uh, sufficient statistics for our signals of hygiene that have been instructed from the text of Yelp reviews, what we're going to do is aggregate the eight most informative sufficient reductions into one single hygiene signal, so vermin and um, and uh, food handling, um, and we're going to look at their effect on demand. And we're going to actually look at the heterogeneous effect that these, um, that these uh, statistic has on restaurants that should be and shouldn't be, should be more or less exposed to consumers' reviews. Okay, I'll be more specific in a second. So first of all, let me show you just OLS regressions that show a really strong correlation between the average Yelp rating and the probability of being sold out on open table. Once we instrument, actually, for the average Yelp rating and the uh, letter grade A, we don't see any statistical uh, effect, statistically significant effect, of just the average Yelp rating and the letter grade uh, posted uh, at the door. For the, grade, for the letter grade posted at the door, we're not really surprised in the sense that a we have a selected sample of, of, uh, of restaurant um, uh, patrons, these are the people who book online on open table, so they might not be aware of the letter grade posted at the door. For the average Yelp rating, um, what we can justify it with is that a lot of uh, uh, restaurant ratings online are now uh, sort of biased upward. There's a lot of literature that shows that there's a lot of uh, uh, inflation towards high grades. And so people might be taking uh, a lot more effort, might be putting a lot more effort in evaluating what actually the text of Yelp reviews actually says. Um, when we look at the effect of our informative hygiene signals on the probability of being sold out, you can see that actually a one standard deviation 
change in the informative hygiene signals lead to a 3% point reduction, percentage point redu reduction in the probability of being sold out. And this is off of a probability of being sold out of 16%. So it's quite a large, uh, a large effect. Now, this is just because we don't have an instrument, this is just correlational. But if you think that certain restaurants are more subject to online reviews because their customers are more likely to choose restaurants on the basis of online reviews, we would expect, for example, that Manhattan restaurant, where a lot of the tourists go, might be more exposed to the informative signals than non-Manhattan restaurant. And so we would expect a bigger effect or the effect on sold out probability mostly loading on Manhattan restaurants. And that's exactly what we find. We also look at other uh, type of heterogeneity, uh, periods in which Google search trends um, uh, suggest that consumers look for New York City restaurants at a high rate are also periods in which the informative signals has a bigger effect on the sold out probability. Um, recently opened restaurants for which there's no uh, recurring customers, there's not a lot of information about the true quality, are more affected by the informative uh, signal from Yelp. Um, and restaurants that are young, sort of in their first year of, um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the last few years that have uh, opened in the last few years. Okay, so um, we've shown that demand is sort of seems to be responsive to this quality signal that comes from Yelp reviews. And so for the last piece of, of the research, if demand is responsive, then cons uh, restaurant owners should have the incentives to actually invest in higher quality when their, um, uh, their restaurant is more exposed to this signal, okay? And so how do we look at this? We sort of look at this as a, as, as a definitive. So I've shown you that there are some violations some dimensions of hygiene for which Yelp is more informative than for other dimensions of hygiene. So Yelp is informative for mice, it's not informative for pipes and maintenance. And uh, some restaurants are more visible on Yelp than other restaurants, okay? Because they receive more reviews or just because they are on Yelp relative to others. And so we would expect that restaurants that are visible on Yelp are going to comply more with violations that are for which Yelp serves as a more informative signal compared to violations for which Yelp is not an informative signal and compared to restaurants that are less visible on Yelp, okay? And so to do that, we're gonna run regressions at the violation inspection restaurant level, okay? And uh, we have basically three different uh, measures of visibility. Being on Yelp, so we're comparing the cafeterias to the restaurants, that's probably not a great comparison group. Um, we can look at whether a particular restaurant has received reviews in the last 90 days. That restaurant is more visible on Yelp currently than a restaurant who hasn't received the reviews in the last 90 days. And then we can actually look at a more continuous measure of visibility being the number of reviews received in the last 90 days, okay? And the outcome of this regression is going to be a dummy for whether the restaurant is going to cite, whether an inspector uh, cited restaurant I for violation J, okay? And so um, I'm just going to show you um, two sets of, yes, um, two sets of regression, we can actually iteratively add all of these visibility measures, um, but all of these visibility measures have the same problem that I described to you for the demand regressions. There might be an observables that are both correlated with what an inspector sees and whether uh, a restaurant has, has reviews um, on, uh, on Yelp. So to do that, we're gonna try to instrument uh, for the number of reviews with the propensity 
of reviewers to leave reviews on Yelp. So if you look at my profile on Yelp, I basically left one review ages ago. I haven't updated my profile. I left Palo Alto three years ago. And that's sort of a consumer who's not very um, prolific on Yelp. If you compare me with a colleague at Microsoft um, who has hundreds and hundreds of, of reviews, you can see that our propensity to, to review a restaurant, to review a restaurant is, is completely different. And so we can actually instrument for the number of reviews of a restaurant or the uh, whether a restaurant has received the re reviews in the last 90 days with this propensity to review of, of, uh, of their um, own reviewers, okay? And so if we do that, once we look uh, at the probability to violate for informative violations, and where the visibility measure on Yelp is whether you have recent reviews in the last 90 days, basically off of 18% a, a, a probability of violating on any given violation, the uh, reduction in that probability is about one percentage point if that violation is um, is such that Yelp is an informative signal and that's a restaurant who's more visible on Yelp. So it's not a huge effect, but it's sort of uh, statistically significant and uh, um, economically um, um, sort of acceptable, I would say. Um, the same holds if we look at um, sorry, this was an OLS regression. This is the DIV regression. And we can actually look at the number of recent reviews um, and uh, the effect stays the, relatively the same and statistically significant. So just to summarize in the last two, three minutes that I have, um, hopefully what I've shown you is that um, consumer reviews are not perfect substitute to regulation. Consumer reviews can predict certain types of quality, certain dimensions of hygiene, but not others. Um, hopefully I've shown you that we have some evidence that these informative signals actually affect demand in the direction that we would expect. So when consumer reviews talk about poor hygiene standards, consumers decide to go to those restaurants with lower likelihoods. And because of this responsiveness of demand, restaurants are going to comply with hygiene standards uh, relatively more uh, for those dimensions of hygiene that are visible on Yelp um, to the extent that those restaurants are visible. And so this hopefully has some policy implications. We've shown that the substitutability between inspectors and online reviews is not just a yes or no answer, but might differ by task, by whether we look at mice or pipes. And so this is going to have some implications for the allocation of regulator resources and uh, for some limitations of actually platform self-regulatory ability. Thank you. Hi, really nice talk. I was wondering if you've looked for um, changes over time. Um, and how how much negative Yelp reviews might affect or might impact a restaurant's decision to improve their hygiene? Yeah, so we um, unfortunately the, the the regulatory framework allows us to use data from 2010 to 2018 and 2017, and this is New York, and this is a sort of a moment where Yelp was already popular in, in New York and already popular for most of the restaurants. Um, if, if you were to extend the study to other cities where Yelp actually became popular in, uh, in more recent years, um, you, you could look at the difference before and after. Here we really, we really it's, it, it, it's, it's really difficult to do it. 
Um, I mean, any change would have already happened. One thing that we can actually, so you can actually look at the AUC, so the predictability of violations over time. Um, and we've done that. And uh, for some uh, dimensions, actually, the predictability increases over time. So we're doing a better job at predicting um, the presence of mice in restaurants with 2016 uh, data than with 2012 data. Uh, yeah, I just wonder if you have looked at the uh, the interaction effects between, say, the price of sort of how expensive the restaurant generally is, and also the reviews how how they. Okay. Yeah, sort of. I I try to avoid to talk uh, talking about price, but as an economist, of course, I should. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, one of the things, actually, let me show you. So one of the things that really surprised us is that if you look at the initial score, so the, the, the violation scores by restaurant price, you would think that you know, high quality restaurants are cleaner. These distributions are very similar to one another. Um, so these are high-end restaurants, these are the most pricey restaurants, and these are inexpensive restaurants. And their distribution of, the distribution of initial score is actually very, very similar. There's one thing, though, that we, again, swept under the rug, which is to the extent that you invest in quality as a restaurant owner, you might be able to increase your price. And we basically assumed that away. Um, just because the, the type of quality investment that we think of is sort of this short term, whether you want to apply mouse repellent this month or not. And so we don't think of it as dramatically changing the, the price that you charge your consumers. So how this might affect the psychology of reviewers? Oh, I see. Um, we, we haven't really, that's a good question. We haven't really run our predictability measures on differently by restaurant, but we might be better or worse at predicting like hygiene scores for pricey restaurants versus non-pricey restaurants. I don't know the answer to that, but that's a good question. Once again, abusing my privilege as session or as chair of the talk. Um, so I want to think about optimal platform design here for the reviewing system. One of the craziest things that, uh, that we see from your study, I think, is that customers can actually identify whether there's a rat potentially accurately. You know, uh, I, I, I totally like, you know, stunned to learn that, you know, that customers on average seem to be able to pick up on some of these reservable violations and then report them in ways that at least sort of, uh, you know, link up with the violations themselves. Should Yelp add like a, you know, click here if you saw a rat or a mouse or something button that's then directly linked to the, uh, to the hygiene inspection institution? Um, so it's, 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 you know, with online reviews, it's always uh, playing a game of whack-a-mole. Uh, whenever you design something, the business owners are going to try and, and manipulate it. So um, there might be business owners paying people um, to try and say, never found a rat, never found a rat. So who knows? <laughs> I guess this is partly following on from what Scott asked, but the um, this sort of text-based analysis is cool, but can we do this with pictures? Or is anybody trying to do this pictures? I think part of the sort of verifiability Scott is... Scott did. <laughs> Scott did it for, you know, cities, I think. Yeah. Can we do it, we do it for, for... Did you do it for restaurants? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> so how would we go about this since this is a big so data conference? So I, uh, I, so I, I, we've as economists, we started just by looking at the average rating, <laughs> one to five. We're slowly moving to text. Maybe in a few years we'll move to pictures. But that's a great question because, again, you know, when you when when the business owners start manipulating the aggregate score. People might be more truthful with text. When that gets manipulated, people might be more truthful with pictures. There's there's work uh, being done uh, on rest on hotel reviews because uh, some people leave hotel pictures, especially on TripAdvisor. Um, if you have a contact with TripAdvisor, I would 
love to um, talk to you about it.